Uh, Oscar Esteban uh, is a research interests include the diffusion MRI and investigating signal processing methods for image correction in order to improve reliability for mapping the structural connectivity of the human brain. He is uh, one of the main contributors of uh, fMRI prep, a piece of software that is uh, slowly establishing itself as one of the standards for fMRI data preprocessing. The title of the talk is uh, Building Next Generation Preprocessing Pipelines, the fMRI prep experience. Oscar, the microphone is yours. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Oscar Esteban and uh, I'm going to talk about how we are building a framework of uh, pre-processing pipelines for neuroimaging called NIPREPs based on the fMRI prep experience. Let's begin with some of the history behind fMRI prep. Am I sharing the screen by the way? Uh, no, not yet actually. Okay, good to realize. No problem, you were just introducing yourself so that's yeah. fine. <laughs> okay, here you are. Cool. You should be looking at the slides now. Go for Perfect. it. Perfect. So um, let's begin with uh, some of the history behind fMRI prep. fMRI prep takes in a task based or resting state functional MRI dataset in bits format and returns pre processing data, pre processed data ready for analysis. Preprocessed data can be used for a broad range of analysis and they are formatted following the bits derivatives specifications to maximize compatibility with major software packages, uh, for example, AFNI, FSL, SPM, uh, further temporal filtering and denoising, uh, for example, the fMRI denoise tool or any other bits derivatives uh, workflow that is uh, compliant with the specifications, for example, fitlinks. FMRI prep adopts the bits up specifications. That means the software is tested with every change to the code base. It also means that packaging, containerization, and deployment are also automated and require the same tests integrated to be passing. Bits apps are interoperable via the bits derivatives specification and optimized for execution in HPC, cloud, etc. FMRI prep minimizes the human intervention because the user does not need to fiddle with any parameters. They are obtained from the bits structure. However, FMRI prep does allow some flexibility to ensure the preprocessing meets the requirements of the intended analysis. Finally, FMRI prep sits on top of Giant's shoulders. AFNI, FSL, FreeSurfer, Nylearn, all of them implement methods very well backed up and are thoroughly tested on their own. We began on uh, working on fMRI prep back in 2016 with much more humble expectations. We needed to develop a fMRI prep, pre fMRI preprocessing tool leveraging bits, and the tool needs need to be smart enough to adapt the workflow to the input dataset. The tool should also be executable in Open Neuro without human intervention. Please note that at the time, the bits apps specification didn't exist yet. We started out with an eye on HCP pipelines and soon identified that datasets in Open Neuro varied extremely in terms of acquisition protocols and imaging parameters, which is definitely not a problem in it, uh, for HCP pipelines, but uh, because it has very specific requirements for the inputs. With the fast adoption and popularization of fMRI prep, new challenges surfaced. On the right hand side, you'll find the chart of unique visitors to fmriprep.org, which is the documentation website. We realized that transparency is indeed a very hard problem. The first leg of our solution was the creation of a solid report system. FMRI Prep generates one individual report per participant containing information not just to quality control the results, but also to understand the processing flow. We also strive for a comprehensive, thorough documentation. Finally, the so-called citation boilerplate appended to the individual reports describes the actual workflow that has been run, noting, that, no, noting all the software that was applied, including their versions and references. Reproducibility in terms of run-to-run -run repeatability of results became as a more apparent problem. 
and we are always trying to minimize the vibration caused by computational factors, subversions, etc. We always maintain close attention to all the feedback channels. At some point, we were washed over with bugs reports that ne we needed to address. We also started to doubt the robustness against the variability of inputs. And because of that, we set a thorough stress, a stress test plan using data from Open Neuro, which is reported in our nature method paper. Among this feedback flooding, some external friends started to emerge and lent their shoulders in answering questions, fixing bugs, etc. In particular, I want to thank Elizabeth uh, Dupre from McGill and James Kent from University of Iowa uh, for being the earliest adopters and contributors. These developments resulted in the following default processing pre-processing workflow. <clears throat> At the highest level, anatomical pre-processing the left hand block and functional preprocessing, the right hand block, can be clearly identified as the lar largest workflow units. Ephemeral prep combines the anatomical images at the input in one anatomical reference, removes the intensity non uniformity, delineates brain tissues, reconstructs surfaces, spatially normalizes uh, the anatomical reference to one or more standard spaces, etc. In the functional pathway, a reference is calculated for further processes, then head motion parameters are estimated. Please note that head motion is accounted for only in the last resampling step in combination with any other transforms uh, calculated along the way. And finally, slice timing correction is applied if requested. Susceptibility distortion can be estimated if sufficient information in terms of acquisition and metadata are found in the bit structure. Finally, data are mapped onto the same individual's anatomical reference and outputs uh, requested uh, in several spaces by the user, along with a file gathering time series of nuisance signals. So let's walk through one example of report. Reports have several sections, starting with a summary indicating the particularities of this dataset and workflow choices made based on the input data. The anatomical section follows with several visualizations to assess the anatomical processing steps mentioned before, and for example, spatial normalization to template spaces, uh, as you can see in this uh, flickering panel uh, right now between uh, the individual image and the template image to assess the alignment between them. Finally, surface reconstruction. Then, all functional runs are concatenated and all show the same structure. After an initial summary of this particular run, the alignment to the same subjects and anatomical image is presented with contours of the white on file surface as cues. Next panel shows the brain mask and ROIs utilized by Concord Noise. For each run, we then find some visualizations to assess the generated confounding, confounding signals. After all functional runs are presented, and now we are at uh, run two, for example, the about section gives information to aid reproducibility of results. For example, the exact software version used or the exact command line run. The boilerplate is found next with a text version shown by default and tabs to convert to Markdown and LaTeX. You can copy and paste from this uh, panel into your paper directly. Finally, reports conclude with a list of encounter errors, if any were encountered. Therefore, reports have become a fundamental feature of ephemeral prep because they not only allow assessing the quality of the processing, but also provide an insight about the logic supporting such processing. In other words, reports help respond to the what was done and why was it done in addition to the how well it did. We promptly identified the need for a very comprehensive documentation. The website at fmareprep.org covers a substantial area of how the tool works under the hood and how to best operate it. The documentation turned out to be a great icebreaker for contributions who have pushed uh, for contributors who have pushed forward fundamental sections of it. 
most of the largest, largest increments in documentation are the result of discussion in hackathons, WSprints, Neurostars, GitHub, etc. A hallmark example was pull request 1877 by Carolina Fink, who gathered together a massive amount of knowledge from many contributors. Now it is up and open in our documentation website. To ensure the future sustainability of the project, what some developers call pass factor, we are transitioning the tool to Nitrax, transferring the large community nurtured over the past four years with it. In return, beyond the rewards of being part of an open source project, FME Prep gives some scientific credit back in the form of publications. All contributors are invited to co-author these publications and anything that helps the project is considered a sufficient contribution. So for example, an exchange on our GitHub uh, issues repo. With the development of FMRA Prep, we understood that researchers don't want to waste their time on pre-processing, except for those researchers actively developing new pre-processing techniques. The current neuroimaging workflow requires extensive knowledge in sometimes orthogonal fields, such as neuroscience and computer science. Dividing the label in labs, communities or individuals with the necessary expertise is fundamental for the advance of the whole field. For instance, imagine someone who runs, there's an, sorry, there's an implicit risk in making things too easy to operate. For instance, imagine someone who runs FMA prep on diffusion data by tricking the bits naming into an apparently functional MRI dataset. If FMA prep reached the end at all, the garbage at the output could be fed into further tools in a sort of a snowballing problem. When researchers have access to the guts of the software and are given an opportunity to understand what's going on, the risk of misuse is mitigated. AFNI, ANTS, FSL, Presurfer, SPM, all of them have comprehensive software validation tests, methodological validation tests, stress tests, etc., which pushed up their quality and made them fundamental for the field. Therefore, it is better to keep things that way, although some minimal efforts towards convergence in compatibility are, of course, welcome. The enormous success of FMI prep led us to propose its generalization to other MRI and non-MRI modalities, as well as non-human species, for example, rodents. And in particular, and also in particular populations currently unsupported by FMRI prep, such as infants. The goal, therefore, of f preps is to extend the scanner so that, in a way, the, it produces data ready for analysis. We liken this analysis-grade data to sushi-grade fish because in both cases, the product is minimally pre-processed and at the same time safe to consume as is. For the last two years, we've been decomposing the architecture of FMRA prep, spinning off these constituent parts that are valuable in other applications. This process of decoupling, to use proper CS terms, has been greatly facilitated by the modular nature of the code since in its inception. The pre-processing elements extracted from FMA prep can be mapped onto three regimes of responsibilities. At the bottom, software infrastructure composed by tools ensuring the collaboration and the most basic operations. Middleware utilities, which build more advanced tooling based on the foundational operations. And at the top of the stack, end user applications, namely FMRI prep, DMRI prep, SMRI prep, and MRI QC. As we can see, the boundaries of these three architectural layers are soft, and tools such as template flow may stand in between all two areas. Only projects enclosed in the brain shape in this chart pertain to the NIPREPS community. NIPIPE, NIPAPLE, and PITS are so deeply embedded as dependencies that NIPREPS can't be understood with them, without them. PITS is one of the keys to success for FMRI prep and consequently a strategic element, element of NIPREPS. Because the tools so far are written in Python, PyBITS is a powerful tool to index and query inputs and outputs. The code snippet illustrates the ease to find out the list of subject identifiers from a dataset, as well as, for example, sessions or uh, tasks. 
all nine preps must write out its derivatives. As illustrated in the example, the outputs of ephemeral prep are very similar to the bit standard for acquired data. All end user applications in NIPREPS must conform to the PITS apps specifications. The PITS apps paper identified a common pattern in neuroimaging studies where individual participants and runs are processed first individually and then based on the outcomes, further levels of data application are executed. For this reason, PITS apps define two major levels of execution, participant and group levels. Finally, the paper also stresses the importance of containerizing applications to ensure long-term preservation of run-to-run -run repeatability and proposes common command line interface, a common command line interface as described at the bottom of the slide. First, the name of the bits apps, in this case, FMA prep, followed by input and output directories, respectively, to finally indicate the analysis level always participant for the case of ephemeral prep. NIPIPE is the glue stitching together all the underlying neuroimaging toolboxes and provides the execution framework. The snippet shows how the widely known PET tool from FSL can be executed using NIPIPE. This is a particular example instance of interfaces, which provide uniform access to the tooling with PIPE. Finally, combining these interfaces, we generate processing workflows to fulfill higher level processing tasks. For instance, we may have a look into FMA Prep's functional processing block. NIPIPE helps understand and open windows in the black box, generating this graph representation of workflows. NIPAPL allows Python to easily access neuroimaging data formats, such as Nifty, Gifty, or SIFT. Although this might, be a, this might seem a trivial task, the proliferation of uh, neuroimaging software has led to some sort of wild west of formats, and sometimes interoperation is not unsure. In the snippet, we can see how we can manipulate the orientation headers of a Nifty volume, in particular of a broaden dataset with incorrect affine information. Night Transforms is a super interesting toy project where we are exercising our finest coding skills. It completes naive able in the effort of making spatial transform transforms calculated by neuroimaging software tools interoperable. When it goes beyond the alpha state, it is expected to be merged into naive able. At the moment, Night Transforms is already integrated in FMA prep above 20.1 to concatenate LTAs, linear transforms uh, arise obtained with uh, a free software. It also concatenates IPK transforms sim seamlessly uh, calculated, uh, it IPK transforms calculated with hands and motion parameters estimated with FSL. Compatibility across formats is hard due to the many arbitrary decisions in establishing the mathematical framework of the transform and the intrinsic confusion of applying a transform. So let's uh, dive into it. While intuitively we understand applying a transform as just transforming the moving image so that I can represent it overlaid or fused with the reference image and both should look aligned. In reality, we are only transforming coordinates from the reference image into the moving images space. And this is uh, represented in step one on the right. Once we know where the center of every voxel of the reference image falls in the moving image coordinate system, we read in the in, in, uh, intensity information, in other words, a value from the moving image. Because the location will probably be off grid, we interpolate such a value from the neighboring uh, voxels. And this is step two. Finally, in step three, we generate a new image object with the structure of the reference image but the data interpolated from the moving information. This new image object is the moving image actually moved onto the reference frame and thus both look aligned. One of the most ancient feature requests received from FMA prep 
early adopters was improving the flexibility of spatial normalization to standard templates, other than the FMA preps default. For instance, infant templates. Template flow offers an archive of templates where they are stored, maintained, and redistributed, and the Python client that helps accessing them for humans and also machines. On the right hand side, and a screenshot of the template flow browser shows some of the templates currently available in the repository. The browser can be reached at www.templateflow.org. The tool is based on PyBits, and the snippet will surely remind you of it. In this case, the example shows how to obtain the T1 template corresponding to FSL's MNI space at the highest resolution. If the files requested are not yet in templates flows uh, cache, cache uh, folder, they will be pulled down and kept then for further utilization. The archive allows a rich range of data and metadata to be stored with the template. Data types in the repository cover images containing population average templates, masks, for example, brain masks, atlases, including parcellations and segmentations, and finally transforms between templates. Metadata can also be stored with the usual bits options. Finally, templates allow having multiple cohorts in a similar encoding to that of uh, multi-session uh, bits datasets. Multiple cohorts are useful, for example, in infant templates with averages at several gestational ages. My workflows is historically the first component detached from ephemeral prep. For that reason, its scope and vision has very fuzzy boundaries as compared to the other tools. The most relevant utilities incorporated within my workflows are, first, the individual report system, which aggregates the visual elements or of the reports, which we call reportlets, and generates the final HTML document. Also, most of the engineering behind the generation of these reportlets and their integration with NiPipe are part of NIPI workflows. Beyond the extension of NiPi to generate reportlet from any given interface, NIPI workflows is the test bed for many other utilities that are then upstream to NiPi. Also, special interfaces with a limited scope that should not be included in NiPi are maintained here. Finally, NIPI workflows indeed offers workflows that can be used by end user NIPREPs. For instance, Atlas-based brain extraction of anatomical images based on ants. Echoplanar imaging, EPI, are typically affected by distortions along the face encoding axis, caused by the perturbation of the magnetic field at tissue interfaces. Looking at the report lat here, we can see how in the before panel, the image is worked. So we can wait to the, to the label before to show up and we look, we focus on the image. The distortion is most, most obvious in the coronal view, middle row, because this image has posterior to anterior face encoding. Focusing on the changes between before and after correction in this coronal view, we can see how the blue contours delineating the corpus callosum. So we will be looking here, if you look at the pointer of my mouse, fit better the dark shade, this little dark shade here, in the data after correction. With SDC flows, FNA prep implements a rather sophisticated pipeline for the estimation of susceptibility distortions. Depending on whether the input dataset contains EPI images with opposed phase encoding polarities, the so called PE polar correction, field maps as gradient recalled eco sequences, or the field map less estimation is requested, then SDC flows establishes a hierarchy of corrections. After correction, we are interested in assessing that low frequency distortions have been accounted for and that high frequency with extreme regions suffering severe drawbacks are not excessively present. SMRA prep corresponds to the split of the anatomical pre-processing workflow originally proposed with fMRI prep. 
With the support of template flow, the tool now supports spatial normalization to one or more templates found in the template flow archive. It also supports the use of custom templates whenever they are correctly installed in the template flows cache folder. DMRA prep and FMRA prep are, of course, the tip of the iceberg. DMRA prep is still in alpha state, steadily progressing through the path FMRA prep has delineated for NIPREPs. Hopefully, at this point of the talk, FMRA prep doesn't need further description. Some additional components of NIPREPs were never part of FMRA prep's code base, or they have been started recently. Such is the case of the quality control tools. MRIQC produces visual reports for the efficient screening of acquired, meaning unprocessed, data, in particular, anatomical and functional MRI of the human brain. Crowd MRI is an internet service where anonymized quality control metrics are uploaded as they are computed by MRIQC. The end goal is to crowdsource or gather enough data to describe the normative distribution of these metrics across image parameters and scanning devices and sites. Finally, MRIQC nets encloses several machine learning projects regarding the quality of acquired images. So what's coming up next? First, Night Babies is some sort of uh, network equivalent for the pre-processing of infant imaging. At the moment, only Atlas-based brain extraction using ANTS and adapted from night workflows is in active development. Next steps include brain tissue segmentation. Similarly, night rodents is the night workflows parallel for the pre-processing of rodent preclinical imaging. Again, only Atlas-based brain extraction adapted from night workflows is being developed. In a mid-term future, both <coughs> Nye Babies and Nye Rodents should allow the extension of FMRA prep to these new two idiosyncratic data families. In addition, plans for a molecular imaging or PET pre-processing Nye prep are being designed. To wrap up, I've presented Nye preps, a framework for developing pre-processing workflows inspired by Nye FMRA prep. The framework is heavily principled and tags along bits as a foundational component. Nypreps should not be built, reinvent any wheel, trying to reuse as much as possible of the widely used and tested existing software. Nypipe serves as a glue component to orchestrate workflows. But why just pre-processing with a very strict scope? We propose to think about pre-processing as part of the image acquisition and reconstruction process, in other words, scanning, rather than part of the analysis workflow. This decoupling from analysis comes with several absolutes. First, there are less moving parts to play with for researchers in the attempt to fit their methods to the data instead of fitting the data with their methods. Second, such division of labor allows the researcher to use their time in the analysis. Finally, two pre-processed uh, datasets from two different studies and scanning sites should be more homogeneous when, pre when processed with the same instruments in comparison to processing them with idiosyncratic lab-managed pre-processing workflows. However, for uh, NIPREPs to work, we need to make sure the tools are transparent not just with the individual reports and thorough documentation, also because the community-driven the community development. For instance, the peer review process that goes around large incremental changes is fundamental to ensure the quality of the code. In addition, best engineering practices suggested in the BITSAPS paper, along with those we have been including with FME prep, are necessary to ensure the quality of the final product. As an open problem, problem, validating the results of the tool remains extremely challenging for the lack of a gold standard in datasets that can tell us the best possible outcome. So I want to conclude just uh, 
making some uh, announcement that uh, I will be soon taking a new appointment in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, uh, at SHUF under the University of Lausanne. And I will be opening an ESD position uh, for anyone interested, uh, mostly focusing on the validation uh, part I just mentioned. With that, I want to thank you all and uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, so um, my, uh, I, I start myself, uh, uh, Oscar, if uh, if I may, and um, and I'm not part of the neuroimaging community. So the question I'm going to ask might be a bit. Uh, um, trivial for the others, but it's actually a curiosity I have. So from my understanding, uh, what you guys have implemented is kind of hierarchical, right? There is, uh, on the bottom, there are different algorithms developed by different communities. And then on top of that, there is NiPipe. And then on top of that, um, there is what you have uh, presented. So um, my, my question uh, is uh, actually on two sides. The first side is, how do you choose uh, which algorithms to include? I mean, you pick because the community knows uh, that uh, these are the best uh, softwares and the best uh, software and the best algorithms. So you wrap them around. They are just, you know, uh, part of the, the common uh, workflows of the community. So they, they include. And the second part is how much uh, do users uh, can, can uh, um, how to say, how much uh, power do have uh, users on, on, on the parameters? inside the, the algorithms? Uh, thank you. Uh, both are really, really interesting questions. And uh, I think, uh, as you say, they easily generalize to any other uh, field or of uh, neuro, you know, uh, neuroscience. So the first, quest the first question was uh, why this particular algorithm for this given step instead of you know, this other one, which is also proposed. Um, so for FRA prep, we've been always trying to find uh, published papers, so literature supporting uh, this decision. Um, it's honestly, you, you not always find uh, these uh, papers uh, because uh, every developer or every uh, proposer of a tool will tell you their tool is, is the best. Uh, so finally, there are very scarce papers where um, someone, a third party, compared several software and uh, made some objective assessment of uh, which method is best. Yeah. So whenever there's uh, this uh, information uh, or there's some agreement in the community, for example, uh, in, in the newer, newer imaging uh, side of things, uh, ANS uh, is regarded as a, a, the most powerful tool uh, for uh, uh, brain ex uh, registration, uh, nonlinear registration. Uh, but uh, whenever there's no answer to the question, um, we try to uh, first uh, grab whatever the community uh, offers first, uh, which is uh, always nice. And uh, we always are open to uh, rethink things. So at some point, if we discover that uh, this particular tool wasn't the, the right one, uh, the, because the, the workflow is uh, modular uh, and uh, all these units need to fulfill some kind of interface, it's generally easy to uh, replace, pick one out and replace it with uh, another method. So that's, uh, that's another thing. Finally, uh, if you look at uh, the long-term uh, goals of preprocessing, um, if you do this little switch I'm proposing of, uh, instead of thinking of uh, pre-processing as part of the analysis workflow, so the first piece of the analysis workflow, try to think about it as the last piece of the scanning device. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way you don't have access to every screw in the MRI scanner or the EEG scanner or uh, whatever device you're using, uh, we can think of pre-processing the same way. So um, sometimes you don't need to get the best uh, particularly the best performing uh, tool for this particular step. Maybe you just need one that is uh, reliable and always works. And, and what it gives you is, is a very good outcome. And uh, then uh, the second question, uh, can you please repeat it? Because uh, with this... The, yeah. yeah, it was actually very... Uh, connected to this one because I guess like generally you can manipulate parameters uh, oh, right yes. and so how much can you actually manipulate parameters 
Yeah, so uh, that's actually a, an open discussion uh, in NIPRAT uh, because um, this access to parameters uh, also comes with another problem, which is more computational or computer uh, in, um, uh, software engineering problem, which is the feature creep. Uh, whenever you try to uh, put in a lot of uh, possibilities, flexibility and options into your software, at some point, it becomes a monster that no one yeah. knows how to handle. Yeah. So um, we try to keep uh, the, the degrees of freedom of our researchers in configuring FMA prep as uh, minimalistic as possible. And uh, every time we uh, need to, uh, are suggested to add a new feature which requires another knob to turn in, uh, the process goes through uh, the scrutiny of uh, the contributors. So the, the, there's a time where, you know, while uh, we are creating this new change to the tool, uh, all the usual contributors are called in and asked whether for their opinions, whether this is uh, really worth uh, adding this new uh, parameter, uh, rather than, you know, trying to infer it uh, in some other ways or adding a new heuristic uh, and tests for the heuristic. Uh, but yes, in general, uh, we try to avoid adding as uh, new knobs to the tool. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much for your really exhaustive and precise uh, answers. So there are questions. The first one is uh, from uh, Vittorio. Mm -hmm. Hi, Oscar. Thanks for uh, participating in the workshop. Uh, so I have just a quick comment. Uh, um, so if you want to, to share also your contact, uh, if you're looking for PhD students and stuff like this, if you want to put on screen your contacts, maybe it's worth it. Um, the, my, my question would be related to uh, the passage where you uh, mentioned uh, that uh, you want uh, actually to attach uh, the ephemeral prep uh, to the, let's say, the layer between the scanner itself and the researchers grabbing the data. And I love this point, I would say. Um, so I think like the, one of the most common um, situations in labs is that you have a scanner and then you have like sort of another layer, which is called, which is, which could be, for example, a picture archiving uh, communicating system, a PAX. And then uh, in some ways, uh, researcher, they grab the data. My question was whether you have already experience uh, uh, about some, someone already using uh, such a layer and if you have, for example, uh, suggestions related to, for example, uh, automatic anonymization of uh, the data, the identification and so on. So to give the researchers ready to use data, which are still not, uh, uh, let's say, Pre-browsers in, in some sense, but uh, they are ready to use uh, and way more ready to use uh, with respect to like the, the plain uh, uh, diagrams with bad names. Thanks. Yep. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, we haven't really uh, worked a lot in this integration. Uh, uh, we, when we propose this uh, kind of uh, streamlining these tools to the scanner, uh, we think uh, of it more as of a logical proposal uh, rather than an actual uh, thing you can do. But uh, that said, uh, maybe uh, people are interested in looking into Repronym, which is a project uh, where, where uh, um, basically most of these tools we're talking about are integrated. Uh, it basically by um, attaching to some standards when you are creating your protocol in the MRI scanner, um, this repronym will take care of maintaining the original data, uh, converting into bits, then uh, running software, and everything underneath uh, is supported by Datalab, which is another tool for um, managing uh, scientific data, uh, which I uh, highly recommend. It has a steep learning curve, I have to say, but uh, it really, um, covers you in terms of uh, maintaining your data and uh, keeping versioning it and, and this kind of uh, needs. 
So um, yeah, it would be definitely easy to integrate FMA Prep or MIQC uh, with the, the scanner pipeline uh, using this uh, data lab. And then the second piece I might think of is uh, if we wanted to do that uh, streamlined, uh, at the moment, uh, you would need to connect to the scanner uh, to some uh, cloud service or uh, high performance uh, computing. Because uh, right now, of course, uh, FMA Prep cannot be run in the uh, scanner's uh, hardware. Thank you. So there is another question uh, by Guillaume again. Um, I just was wondering, I don't know if it makes sense, if someone has tried to extend this to the electrophysiology like with EEG and MEG or if it's like too far away from to integrate this and it's better to do something separate. So basically the problem there is uh, no labor. <laughs> This is uh, yeah, maintained by uh, volunteers, basically. And uh, we don't have any expert uh, yet. Uh, so if someone is interested, of course, uh, the doors are open. And uh, the same way BITS is uh, organically growing towards those directions, uh, I'd be super happy to see that night preps are uh, growing as well uh, to these new modalities. OK. Well, yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, I will, yeah, I think the community needs to be more aware of this kind of uh, way of pre-processing. I think, well, I'm not super expert, but my feeling is that sometimes um, we are a bit behind because the, the, just because the, the signal, the characteristics of the oral signals are a bit different and the image and the signals are richer so there's much more variability in the analysis but sometimes when I see all these super well packaged things for MRI I think oh we should go there. Um, yeah I would say I, I would say probably the reason why uh, there's this uh, gap between the two worlds is because more people are currently working on neuroimaging. Uh, I don't know the reasons why but uh, maybe because it's easy or because uh, at some point it gave uh, away very easy results uh, and uh, people you know, were attracted to MRI, but... Uh, there's in every there's an MRI. I, I can't, I can't uh, identify any uh, idiosyncrasy in EEG that uh, prevents uh, doing this uh, approach to pre-processing. Thank you, thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the while, I allow myself to ask you uh, another question, Oscar. I am mm -hmm. very curious uh, about uh, the, um, the 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 software structure, what what is behind, you know. And uh, and I've seen that um, when you showed the reports, if I am correct, that there were a couple of mm -hmm. tabs, and, and and one could click uh, on the different tabs. Um, these looked very similar to Jupyter notebooks. Uh, are they actually something like that or it's just that I see it everywhere because I work with it? So, no, they are not uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, it could be a solution uh, for the problem, but uh, so you're referring to these uh, tabs here, right? Yes, because also like the font uh, of the text, like summary and so on, looks very similar. So yeah, uh, this so is why I think I got... <laughs> So the reason is uh, here we're using a JavaScript library, uh, very widespread in uh, you know the web development community called Bootstrap, and uh, this Bootstrap thing uh, gives you these uh, elementary components uh, for HTML code. Uh, so that's that's why you see all those <laughs> similarities. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, but the engineering this, behind this is really, really much more simple than you could then. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and uh, like from the wrapping layer up, it's all Python, or you use uh, something else behind? You know, uh, the, the the screen. The um, sorry, the 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 web interfaces. Yeah. So um, let me pull this up. Again, so yeah, uh, all these projects are done in, uh, except for bits, uh, and you have five bits uh, there. Uh, but 
but all the projects at the moment are done in, uh, in Python. Okay, okay. But it doesn't mean uh, it's restricted to Python. Uh, it's just uh, we haven't yet hit a, a blocker where we need to really use C++, for example, to solve a particular task. Yeah, which is but pretty But with the emergence, nice. yeah, with, yeah. I don't know, with the emergence of uh, American C nets, for example, it could be the case that at some point we need to fiddle with uh, C++ or something. Else. And, and from a coding, let's say, perspective, how do you see this evolving in the, uh, I explain myself better, do you think that this kind of coding and wrapping and so will last for another couple of years or you see some new change coming up soon that we have, you know, to get ready? Because like Python now, it's getting and is, you know, the way to go. Do you think it's going to stay? Or as you're saying, like, how do you envision the, like, if you had to start a completely new pipeline today, what would you do? Oh, uh, if I had to do it, uh, I would go with, um, with Python. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make some uh, self-advertisement uh, uh, because uh, we're working it. on Nightpipe and um, we're working on one thing we call Nightpipe 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, well, we are uh, renaming the project, splitting it in parts. Uh, if you remember, uh, Nightpipe uh, gives you this uh, interfaces, yep. workflows, and execution. Yep. So we're decomposing the three elements, and um, uh, the interfaces will be apart because that's just a wrapper for, for existing software. Yep. And then uh, the workflow engine and the execution uh, we're packing it together in something called Python. And uh, this is like uh, the new generation uh, uh, workflow engine. And this Pydra is not uh, tailored to uh, near imaging. Mm -hmm. Actually, they are right now working on a lot of examples to uh, use, for example, scikit-learn. Mm -hmm. So it's open to any kind of uh, scientific workflow. And uh, basically, we are trying to apply all the lessons learned uh, with uh, Nightpipe in this new uh, workflow. And one of the things uh, more attractive uh, in this uh, new Pydra thing, uh, which is, I hope, uh, going to be a bit uh, groundbreaking, is that uh, it's going to be the first uh, workflow engine with uh, uh, native support to uh, Funning in and funning out uh, structures, meaning uh, at the moment, uh, one of the limitations of Nightpipe and most of the workflow engines is that uh, before you try to do a parameter sweep, you need to know all the parameters you want to test. So you can do parameter sweeps, but you need to know exactly the inputs at the beginning. And uh, Python is going to be flexible enough. Uh, to understand uh, when it needs to calculate these uh, points in the, along the parameter sweep. So okay. uh, it's going to be completely dynamic depending on the inputs. Uh, it, it's going to have, for example, conditional nodes. So at some point, based on some decision, you can prune out part of the computational graph. And uh, those things are currently not supported by uh, almost, I don't think, uh, any uh, workflow engine. Mm -hmm. And maybe next flow, but uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this Pydra thing is going to be pretty groundbreaking. Uh, but in terms of uh, more uh, low level things, Python, I, I guess, is, is going to still be the, the, the main problem. And more in the, term, in, in, in the sense of applications, uh, mm -hmm. who knows when all this uh, deep learning revolution will uh, basically explode and finally take out of the way all the all the traditional uh, pipelines. Yeah, because right now in these uh, tools that you uh, have included, you do not have any deep learning core um, functionalities or you already have some? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think so, not yet. Okay. okay, and are you planning in that or you're kind of still waiting a bit to see what happens yes. and then? Uh, yes, uh, for instance, one uh, area of the workflow uh, that is very ripe for that is uh, this, uh, let me go to the anatomical processing. So this uh, surface uh, reconstruction here is mm -hmm. uh, very costly. Uh, usually okay. it takes around six hours to 24 hours to run a, one individual. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, right now, just uh, last OHBM, uh, a new package was proposed uh, called FastSec, I believe. And uh, it does the same task in seconds. Wow, yeah. And because, yeah, because, you know, I don't know the accuracy of this, uh, yeah. but as long as it is uh, decent enough, uh, every prep doesn't need a super accurate uh, surface reconstruction. Okay, this is really very interesting. Yeah, okay, great, thanks a lot. Uh, so are there any questions? Let me check here all my setup. Um, I was very, very much into uh, this discussion. Uh, <laughs> I don't uh, uh, see any uh, question. So I really thank you for uh, this extremely interesting um, uh, um, presentation. I've really learned a lot. Uh, and, um, and it's really, really remarkable. And, and so really, thank you very much uh, again. Um, so thank you for inviting me and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.